And welcome back to another episode of Johnny on the Track. And this is one I'm excited for. Two of my buddies here, two of my boys. We've been trying to put this one together for a while. Um, we finally got it, the three of us on Johnny on the Track. And um, we're in for a good one. So for the fans, be ready for a lot of roast, for a lot of hot takes, and uh, a lot of good insight. That's it's for gonna sure. going to be a lot of roasting. Yep, yep, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so I'll start here. Um, what is this? On my right, we've got uh, William Richard, NASCAR underscore opinion on Twitter. He was actually the very first guest ever, very first guest ever on Johnny on the Track. He's also the co-founder of World Racing Media. Will, first, thank you for coming on. Good to see you again. Oh, yeah, it's always fun. We're going to talk a little bit of racing. Um, we're going to talk about a certain championship pick that turned out to be pretty bad. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Have some fun. Oh, man, that's early. That's early. All right. And then on my left, we've got another co World Racing Media and the host. Oh, i got a little mic issue. But anyway, the host of the Motorsports Ministry podcast. He is the great in the Colts. Sweatshirt Armani DePaul. Armani, good to see you again as well. This is probably going to be the only time this week that I'm happy because the Colts are probably going to lose to the Titans because Younger. our whole team decided to be injured. We are, we are this year's 49ers. We are this year's 49ers. We're going to go 0-17. Well, you know, I think um, – I can you guys hear me, by the way? Yep. All right, good. cool. I, I think the issue there, Armani, and I know we're not supposed to talk NFL, but um, you guys picked a quarterback who really, he really just, at this point, um, he's out to kill himself. And I, I know that sounds kind of <laughs> messed up, but I mean, come on, dude. Like, take a sack. Throw it out of bounds. I mean, this guy, he's got, he's got like some of the best defensive players roped around his knees, as Dan Campbell would say, biting his kneecaps. And he's still running, trying to figure out how to throw the ball. Hey, um, we came in striking distance to beating the Rams. That's true. That's true. Um, but, you know. Don't worry. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's Bristol dirt tickets on the line between who has the better record between the Panthers and the Colts. Uh, I'm not going to toot any horns this early. Oh, but Armani God. is pretty cocky, and uh, the tides are turning. Oh, God. All right. Well. Hey, hey, um, hey. last year the Panthers were 3-2. and two. They finished 5-11. True. That's true. That's true. That's true. You also got um, Will. You got the best running back in the game right now. So you well, can you plays more than three games? Hey, he, he, he he's will. got that. He's got that. So all right. Hey, anyway, we got JT. We got JT. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, I guess like. What do you mean? You guess he had the third most. <laughs> hit the third most yeah. rushing yards in the league. I, mean, last year. I, I guess. Um, yikes. Uh, all right. Anyway, we got to get to it. We got to get to it. So let's go through. Round one. Let's go back a little bit to round one of our NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. Um, so we saw Michael McDowell, who most had. Um, he was eliminated along with Tyler Reddick, who I think is a rising star. Eric Almarola, um, who I love, still one of my favorite drivers. And, of course, the great, the great, and I know you guys have a smirk on your face, Kurt Busch, <laughs> the four eliminated in round one. Um, so – We also saw William Byron and Alex Bowman make it through. Shout out William Byron, who I think a lot of people just did not see having a perfect run. That's what he needed, and it turned out that he had one to move on to the next round. So shout out um, Byron and Bowman. I will start with you, Armani. What were you – you know, did did you expect these four to to drop out of the first round? Um, Were you surprised? What were your takeaways from round one? I'm three for four on the first round. My original eliminations were Michael McDowell, Eric Amarola, Kurt Busch, and Christopher Bell. So, I mean, Michael McDowell and Eric Amarola, they need no explanation, even though Amarola was surprisingly close to making it. Christopher Bell, simply for the fact, Christopher Bell and Kurt Busch, simply for the fact that they were so inconsistent, I thought that they'd carry over to the playoffs, especially because I found a stat that 
Ever since 2016, only one driver with an average finish worse than 16 has made it to the next round, and that's Stenhouse of 2017. Now, that makes two drivers with Christopher Bell make it because his average finish is like 16.6. I thought Reddick would be a little bit stronger, and not to say he was bad, but that that early pit stop, you know, where they had to come back in under caution, it really killed them. Mm-hmm. Had that not happened, he, I probably would have went four for four. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. Look, I, I think it, it, it kind of played out as a lot of people thought, um, not me, but <laughs> a lot of people did, I think, pick these four um, to get out. And well, I'll go to you. What were you, um, did these kind of hit your expectations? Were you a little surprised? Tell me what, uh, about what you thought around I- one. I believe I went two for four. Um, I really had a belief that I, I thought Tyler Reddick could get through the first round. They had a lot of speed, and, and they were close. I mean, they were right where you kind of thought they would be. I just kind of thought they'd be above the line than below. Um, but actually, something to our, what Armani said, there's actually multiple drivers that break that curse of if you don't get through the first round with an average of, of 16th or better, that you, you, you don't transfer. There's actually multiple that ended up doing that. Um, you know, Almarola, I had out McDowell. If you didn't have Michael McDowell out in the first round, you don't <laughs> even make playoff picks. Yeah. Um, Kurt Busch, I, I had him moving at least to the round of 12. That was my limit for Kurt Busch. We know some people thought otherwise, but um, I believe, I think I had, I know I had Bell out, and I believe it might have been, it's either got to be Byron or Keselowski I had out in the first round. Um, and that was the, the, the one or two that I missed. Uh, Bill, I know I missed. I think it might have been Keselowski or Byron that I missed my second one on. Yeah, so again, I, I do think a lot of people had these four. Um, and look, I, I'm a nice guy, so I'm going to give you both 30 seconds to free roast here. Free roast what you want about the Kurt Busch pick. Will, I'll stick with you. Give me, give me your best 30 seconds of, of uh, this Kurt when- Busch championship pick for me. When you said this, I looked at myself and I said, why would someone do this to themselves? <laughs> like, I made the prediction that Kyle Larson wouldn't win a race, right? And that was like as bad a as dumbass. Was, as, as, listen, as bad as of a prediction as that was, I at least felt like I had a reasonable excuse for why it could happen. When you told me Kurt Busch was your title pick, I thought there was – absolutely zero opportunity that that happens he has just as much opportunity to win the title as michael mcdowell because i know it's not oh no no yes in theory he is better than mcdowell but i knew neither was going to happen so it might as well be the same thing oh my god (laughs) all right armani the floor is yours like i said kurt bush has an average finish of 16.4 that's the reason i had him out in round one (laughs) and So That's just for that set, number one, number two, you're going to pick a guy who, before the playoffs started, had only nine top tens on the season. Max. With four top fives, <laughs> you're going to pick that guy to win the championship. He dominates one race in Atlanta. Congratulations. The first race he's dominated since the 1990s. And you're going to pick <laughs> oh, him to win the championship. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> look, 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 look. If you saw, um, I'm blanking on what that second race was, but look at the car, Darlington. Look at the car Chastain brought to Darlington. If he doesn't have the issue, this this is a this is a, this is a whole different season. I think I, I genuinely do. I mean, Ross Chastain was one of the. Fa- I I don't <laughs> I I don't. This disagree. is here's the main. You were never why- going. You're never going to convince me that Kurt Busch at most was going to get passed out of the round of twelve. Here's why I disagree. It, right. Unless your name is Kyle Larson, the playoff grid is so tight that if you make one mistake, which Kurt Busch did, your season's done. I so agree. I honestly think if Kurt Busch even got top 10s or even top 15s at Richmond and Brist- and Darlington, he'd still get eliminated round one because his performance was that bad at Bristol. No, I agree with you. I, I do agree with you. I think, um, th- th- look, these these three races were as tight a playoff as we've ever seen. Uh, and and, and that's, that's not hy- hyperbole. This this really was. I mean, the the drama we saw just the last twenty minutes of the last race um, was something you know not short of spectacular. So, with that, I want to also go back to that last twenty minutes where we saw in I don't know probably like the final 25, 30 laps we saw first chase um, Elliott have the lead. Kevin Harvick comes and tries to take it, slides up, cuts Chase's tire. That's it. Chase's day is done. 
Chase then retaliates. And real quick, this is the issue I have with the current car. That should not cut a tire. I mean, come on. That should that, not cut. A, that's ridiculous. Dude, so that, is, that if I have two seconds, that is the singular reason why I used to be against composite bodies. And now I'm for composite bodies for that very reason. It, it's ridiculous. Um, and I hope, look, you know, with the next gen car, who knows at this point, who really knows? But right. um, we, we hope that 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 won't happen. Um, but we'll, well have the to bodies see are composite. Day. Right, right. But again, I mean, th- from what they're saying, like this is a totally different car, something we've never seen. So we don't know. Um, but yes, so so back to it. Chase Elliott retaliates by kind of going a little door to door with Harvick, then takes his line away, which, you know, leads to the Kyle Larson win. Armani, I'll go back to you. Who, if anyone, was at fault in this? My boy Chase, I'm now officially a Chase Elliott fan. I'm just saying that right now on the air. I'm officially a Chase Elliott fan because he's because <laughs> the number two is coming in clutch for the number one at Hendrick Motorsports. But <laughs> I think it's just Bristol. I mean, Harvick was trying to use the lap car as a pick, and it didn't work. So Harvick at the last second, I mean, you're going 15 seconds around in the lap, 16 seconds at that pace. So you really don't have that much time to just react. So Harvick is like, I got to get out of the way or else I'm going to hit this car. So just bad circumstance to cut the tire. I don't know what Chase is talking about, to be honest, where he's like saying Harvick does this every other week. More like he does it every other time in his career. But in terms of recency, I haven't seen it. So, but like I said, Chase, you're my boy. You come in the clutch for the true goat at HMS. All right, Will, how about you? Let me get your thoughts on it. And I know you're a Chase Elliott fan, so this might Definitely. be a little biased. Chase Elliott fan, but it's uh, if anybody is at fault, it is Chase Elliott. Now, I'm not mad at either one of these drivers. I love it. If people don't get to ever experience half of these cookie-cutter drivers that never get involved in situations, it will get your heart racing. I was pretty much asleep. This all happens on pit road. I couldn't go to sleep for like two hours. <laughs> but the situation that what originally happened is – Harvick pretty much did what Chase Elliott did to Joey Logano a year and a half ago. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a mistake. Harvick drove in the corner. And what I really think happened after I listened to Door Bumper Clear is I don't think Harvick was prepared for Chase to still be there and make it three wide with the lap car. I think Harvick kind of thought Chase was going to give him the spot or he was he was already behind him. And so Harvick just went up in the corner, probably drove it in a little too hard, made a mistake, goes up in the wall. I think if Chase looks at that replay, obviously he doesn't. Well, you're in the heat of the moment. You're strapped in the race car. You just go out and finish the race. He probably says, man, that, that sucks, but that was a mistake. I've been there. I've done the literally exact same thing. But I understand in the heat of the moment, completely right to be pissed off. Then Chase goes back out. And, and to be fair, he manipulated the race. Yes. And we all want races to fold, unfold. And as much as it's eh. fun to watch, and in the heat of the moment, even as a fan, you're like, come on, put it to Kevin. Hold him up. Chase really should not have done that at the end of the day, but Chase has been there. Logano did the same thing to him at Homestead last year, rightfully so. I said Logano did it rightfully so to him last year. And so if Harvick does it to Chase, he has one coming to him. So in theory, Chase is really kind of the one at fault, but I can't fault either drivers in the heat of the moment. I understand both of them being pissed off. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. Um, I, I don't really think it's – Ronnie, you, you said it best. It's Bristol. Um, it, it really is. And look, I loved it. I loved every second of it, especially, I think the coolest part is like, how often do you actually get to see one of the best young drivers in the sport, a champion, the, the reigning champion go against one of the greatest NASCAR drivers of all time, a veteran who's been around also a champion, young gun versus the old guy you know, kind of rookie feel versus the veteran. Like that is so cool. And um, for me, like you made another, you made a great point. Will. you couldn't go to sleep. I mean, everybody, if you weren't checking your phone as like, Oh shit, we hear they're going in the hall or, Oh shit. Maybe NASCAR is coming in to take a talk at that. Like that was just awesome. Um, and it, it's, it's the thing that this sport needs more of. It had a lot of this, you know, in the 90s, the early 2000s, and that's what brought it to the to the highs of the highs, right? And then that, that's yeah. the difference between having a favorite driver and really having a favorite driver is because when moments like that happen, you see how much your driver means to you. 
because I mean, this is perfect. We need to see Chase Sealy in compromising positions. Yeah. If he's going to be the face of the sport, even though he truly needs to do more himself to be that, it takes moments like this where he's up in the face of a veteran. He, he was not afraid. I'm glad I didn't see one tweet that said he tried to run away from the situation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Chase Sealy at one point was telling other crew guys to get out of the situation. Like, let me just talk to Kevin. You need situations like that. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, and this, I, I don't think, I don't think the buck stops here. I think we're going to see a little more come playoff time. Harvick, Harvick left it with, it's coming back to you, buddy. It's coming back to you. Um, and with this round, Las Vegas, the Roval, Talladega. Oh my God. Chase, you know, keep an eye on your rear view mirror, my guy, because this is a round where you don't want to get wrecked because it could absolutely ruin, ruin your season. Um, so let's take it there. As long as Larson wins, I'm happy. Well, fair enough. Um, look, this is this is a podcast where uh, we've <laughs> twice had Tyler Mon on the show, Larson Spotter. So um, we're a big Larson. We're a big Larson show. That's for sure. Um, so let me take it to you, Armani. Round two, like we said, Vegas first, Talladega next, and then we'll finish the round with the um, the Roval. So what are you expecting? We'll we'll go the question with who do you expect to um to to not make it through this round so you have to be a diverse driver you need to be excellent a mile and a half so you need to be a good drafter at super speedways and you need to perform well on the road course that's number one number two are we going to see another surprise elimination yeah. every year we always have a surprise elimination with ryan blaney last year 2019 and 2018 was brad kozowski larson you know dale jr 2014 and 15 Truex and Kozlowski in 2016. Are we going to have that surprise elimination? I think we are. You have, like I said, you have to be a diverse driver. And again, going back to what I said before, the playoff grid, unless your name is Kyle Larson, the playoff grid is so tight that if you make one mistake, you're done. Larson is, I believe, I'm going to check it right now. Larson is 46 points above the cut line. The next is Truex, who's second. He's only plus 16. Oh, God. So if you make one mistake, if your collars could afford one to two bad races, if you have, if any of these drivers have one bad race, they're done. They're, it's over. So who do I have being eliminated? Well, I said it last week. I said on my previous show, I believe I had Alex Bowman. It was Alex Bowman, Brad Kozlowski. Originally it was Tyler Reddick. Now it's Christopher Bell. And my surprise elimination, I got Truex getting eliminated this round. Wow. Wow, that's a shock because this I, is I've the seen... reason. This is the reason why Truex is not as good this season as everyone thinks he is. Agreed. Everyone thinks it because he's winning at the 750 tracks. I've seen people have him as his, their final four, even their championship pick. Let's slow down the horses from before his win at Richmond to his win at Darlington. He had, I believe, only two races where he's led double digit laps. He's never touched the top five in points at all this season. His hot. But after his Darlington win, he never touched the top five of points. The highest he ever got was six. And he's just honestly been very inconsistent. There are times in the season where you're like, where the hell is Truex? And again, because the playoff grid is so tight, yeah, he could probably finish seventh at Vegas and maybe 11th at the Roval, but he's so bad at Talladega, that's not oh, going to be yeah. good enough. Like his, yeah. he average finish at Talladega is like 26. So he can't afford mistakes. And Truex is, Unless he's at a 750 track, which there aren't any minus the Roval, he's average at mile and a half. He's terrible at super speedways, and he's, you know, the Roval, he's average. You mix average, bad, and average, that's not the recipe to make it to the next round. Yeah, and and I remember Will and I kind of went at this when you were bagging early on my uh, my Kurt Busch pick. You said, I'd rather, I'd rather have Truex. And I said, I don't know, because although Truex has had some good – um, runs on the on the mile tracks from i don't know probably like l early summer to the fall he was not good he was not good and he was missing in action um well i'll now take it to you what do you expect who, who are you who do you think um will get eliminated in this round usually this round you separate the pretenders from the contenders it, it's pretty you, 75 percent of the playoff field makes it to the first round obviously mm -hmm. Um, you know, and now we're dwindling ever more. Um, you know, now only 66% of the field make it to the next round. Um, so you, you slowly have to dwindle. Um, when it comes to Truex, I think they'll be fine. I, I predicted two or three years ago, Truex will never be the same without Cole Pern. 
Uh, they've won races, but he, he's never going to be what he was with Cole Pern, arguably the greatest crew chief at that singular time in the sport and walks away. But going out, um, I have my four drivers out, and then I really have like an, an on-deck kind of guy because I'm really nervous about transferring this guy, but right now I'm going to have him moving on. Um, I've got Byron and Bowman out, uh, the disappointments of Hendrick Motorsports. Um, mm. They just can't quite – I think I don't know if they still separate their shops, but they're clearly not what Larson and Elliott are. Um, Keselowski, it tends to be this time of year, you know, he could, he could go out and win Vegas very easily, or he could go finish 25th the next three weeks. He is one of the hardest drivers to predict right now. Really all of Penske is, I don't know where Penske has gone. Um, but they are not clicking like normal. Um, really the only one of those three drivers I have faith in is Logano. Uh, but I have Keselowski out right now. And then Christopher Bell, he, he was able to put down a couple of solid runs. I think he had a seven, he still only had a 17th average finish in the first round, mm -hmm. um, but it was good enough to him to move on. He's probably going to have to improve that to a top 15 average. I don't know if they're ready to do that. So I have him gone. Ryan Blaney is the guy that I do not know about. Ryan Blaney, wow. could go win, he could, he could go win any of the next three races. He's always fast at Vegas. We know what he's like on plate tracks. At the Roval, he's won before, though it took Jimmy Johnson running out of talent. Um, yeah, that's a shot at Armani. Um, <laughs> you know, we've seen him win there, but he's a guy that he could go out and win all three of the next three, three, next three races, or he could literally go finish 30th. I don't know how to read Blaney. This year might finally be the year for him to move on. But like y'all said, I mean, the playoff grid is so tight, and I think it's so tight that I don't necessarily know if you make one mistake, you're out. I think it allows – it allows for maybe a mistake because you're so close. And the way these races go, it, it's not like one guy has a mistake and the rest finish in the top 12. It's literally, it feels like four, five, six guys make a mistake every single weekend. Vegas has been nuts the last few years. Everybody craps on mile and a half, and I get it. Vegas has been one of the top, if not the top mile and a half the last three years. Mm -hmm. And it was two or three years ago where all hell broke loose in the playoffs. Like eight of the drivers had issues. I'm talking about major issues, crashing, done for the day. Um, won't be surprised. We see three or four guys. I don't know what it is. They go to Vegas in the fall. It's like they just lose their minds. Talladega is going to be Talladega. Someone's going to emerge. Someone's not. And then the Roval, uh, you know, I don't think Chase – one of these days Chase Elliott is going to have a problem in a road course. It's yep. You don't just keep winning, four, you know, three years in a row, four years in a row. He's not – I don't know if he's my pick come then. I'll probably love the pick race day morning. I, I think he's going to move on solidly just because he's Chase Elliott. But this is going to be a wild round. We have never had a closer playoff, and we have the wildest round of the entire playoffs in the next three weeks. There's there. I, I feel like there's a reason at this point NASCAR does this because they know basically the top 12 um, are really all guys that not not a cent, not, not exactly. But um, with the exception, I guess, of Christopher Bell and and maybe, you know, Alex Bowman or William Byron. I think anybody could see any of these guys getting hot and winning, yep. winning, winning a championship. Right. And so NASCAR says, let's put a crazy track like Dega right in the middle. Let's end it with one of the wildest road courses on this series in the Roval. And then let's stack it with our best mile and a half in Vegas. Um, it's always a great round. It's always a lot of fun to watch. And um, I'm ready for it. And I'm going to say this for everybody that's listening to this. Quit sleeping on Kevin Harvick. Quit yeah. treating Kevin Harvick like he is the redheaded stepchild and he has no clue what he's doing. Kevin Harvick, I don't know what his average finish was, but I believe I heard on uh, Dave Moody or somebody say today, He's had three top tens in his last three races. He's had mm -hmm. two top fives in his last three races. This team, most of these good teams, they'll have a quiet summer. Truex the same way. And even Chase Elliott for a while was very quiet during the summer. And then they'll just kind of tune it up. And then here we go. Playoff time. We all know what we're doing. We've got our best stuff. We've been experimenting all summer. We didn't really care where we finished at Sonoma. You know, let's go out and go run for a championship. Quit sleeping on Kevin Harvick. Well said. Absolutely well said. Um, we'll just have to see. All right. And so now we're doing something a little different. So the three of us um, have tallied some questions from the fans. This is a lot of fun. And we actually got a lot of responses. So shout out the fans and the people listening. Um, so this is going to be awesome. So we, we really don't have time to, you know, all three of us answer all these questions. There is some that I, I want, you know, all three of us to chime in on. Um, but some of these I'll just pass to, to one of you guys. And um, so let, let's start here. This one's from Jared Monahan at JTM0086 on Twitter. Give him a follow. Shout out, Jared, uh, friend of the show. So he wants to know, and Armani, I'll start with you. 
Where do you think Ty Dillon, if anywhere, lands this season? Or sorry, next season. The rumor is that he's going to GMS next year. There's, I don't know how true those rumors are. I don't think it's a good move. Yeah. No. If I had to guess he's going anywhere, he'd probably be in the same spot just as a journeyman driver. Ty Dillon, he's just not a driver that inspires, like, you know, like a lot of enthusiasm. You announce Ty Dillon's your driver, like, okay. You expect them to probably run seventh at best. So Ty Dillon, I think he's just going to be another journeyman driver. Yeah, Will, I saw you, um, you know, nodding your head and want to get on us on this. I'll, I'll say real quick, um, I always, as you know, both of you guys know, I'm a huge Austin Dillon fan. I think there's so much untapped potential there um, still in him. And Ty Dillon, I've, I've supported. I think at Jermaine, he actually somewhat got the best out of what that um, could be. But, I mean, this year with JGR, um, the races he's run with them in the Xfinity series, he's been abysmal. Uh, I think like the first four races he ran with JGR, he, he didn't finish in the top like 25, which is not good. Um, I, I look, I root for Ty for Ty. He's a great guy. He's came in, um, you know, some, some of these later races, I think with maybe Jordan Anderson, maybe it's been, um, and just come in on short notice and fill in and actually do pretty decent. Um, but look, to me, Ty Dillon, I, I think there's a lot of better options, um, perhaps a Matty D, perhaps a Ryan Priest uh, that could fill these these spots. Will, I'll go to you with this quick. 100% agree. If you've learned anything, you want your kid to be in cup, don't name him Ty. Ty uh, uh, besides Ty Gibbs, he may pan out. <laughs> Ty Majeski and Ty Dillon not panning out. But, uh, but Ty Dillon has just, uh, you know, I don't know if it's luck. I don't know if it's skill. Some drivers just aren't meant to be Cup Series stars. At most, he's a B-level driver. Um, would really would be a smart for a place like a Jordan Anderson racing or somebody mm -hmm. to have full time. But I don't know why they're putting him in a Cup car. Go get Matt DiBenedetto. Go get Ryan Priest. Go get Brett Moffitt. Do yep. something of that nature. There is no reason other than sponsorship why Ty Dillon needs to be in another full time Cup ride. T totally agree. I would also throw Ben Rhodes in that um, in yep. that mix as well. Another talented kind of young guy that I think with a good ride, with a solid ride, could do something. All right, let's let's take it next. So this is actually from one of my one of my best friends, Tristan Deshanes uh, at T D E S C H E N E S seven 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 on Twitter. Um, he wants to know, and I, I like this one. This one's going to spark a little bit of heated debate. Is Denny Hamlin a top three? Yes, top three driver. Um, he said of our generation, I kind of modified a little bit. How about of the 2010s from no. 2010 to 2020? Armani, you no. say no go. No, no. You're going to put Jimmy Johnson, Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch. They're automatically better than Denny Hamlin. They won more championships. They won more races. Hamlin has a winless season in that time. Jimmy Johnson, yeah, he's got two in that time. But still, he's got, I believe, three or four championships in the 2010s and 2020s. Kyle Busch, two-time champion. Kevin Harvick wins a championship. Hamlin is maybe fourth or fifth, but he's nowhere near top three. Will, I'll take it to you. Uh, he put. I was thinking of the drivers. Obviously, you had Jimmy. Um, you know, I, I, those those guys he just named are perfect to show why he's not top three. You could argue even you could put Truex over him. Yeah. Because Truex had a real three or four year span where he was really killing it. So yeah, I mean, he's probably fourth or fifth. You could argue for fourth at highest. So. Fourth, fifth, top five for sure. Top three, no. Yeah, um, look, for me, I love Denny Hamlin. I think he's one of the – I think he's a Hall of Famer. People that don't think he's a Hall of Famer, um, you clearly don't watch enough racing. Um, I mean, that is that is just blasphemy if you don't think oh, he's, no. he's a Hall of Famer. Um, but, yeah, I totally agree. I would put those three. I think Truex and him, Truex is more clutch in the playoffs, plain and simple. Um, he just is. But, man, you could think of if Denny Hamlin just won one, maybe two of those championships, yep. how different a story it would be for him. Um, but, again, a guy the like weird, we – yeah, go. The weird thing about Hamlin is really besides – he's kind of like Carl Edwards and really besides maybe one or two years or like three years max, you really don't see him as a championship threat. I think of 2010, 2019 – 2020 every other year Hamlin kind of just blends in I agree no I agree with you um I think this year really is one of his best shots he's got he's just been super consistent um but will it click and that's the question that's 
Armani, you and I have talked about this before. Like, it, can he be clutch for one race, one stinking race in this format? Um, and he just hasn't yet. And, and it's sad, but I think he could do it. So, all right, we'll move in. Um, this is one that I think all of us needs to get, need to get in on. Um, we'll make it quick. What, let's start with you, Armani. What is your favorite moment from this season? Kyle Larson winning Las Vegas for the simple reasons. I was watching it on my phone. As I, I was on my break at work, I was watching on my phone. As soon as I saw across the checkered flag, the first thing I did is I called this dumbass right over here. And I said, <laughs> what did you say? We are four races in. And what did you say? I said I he wasn't going to win. I love it. I love it. Um, I don't care how bad my Suarez prediction is. I look like a god with that prediction because I was only half a lap away compared to your dumbass prediction. Wow. Uh, strong words. Strong words. Um, but a great moment is a great moment. I'll go quick. Um, what is it? Two weeks ago now, that Xfinity finish was something special. I mean, that was absolutely insane. One of the greatest finishes I've seen. Um, I, I look, I've had a lot of, there's been a lot of good cup moments. I think, you know, a quick, another one, AJ Allmendinger coming from nowhere. One of like everybody's favorite drivers to win at like a place that he absolutely loves chills, literal chills down my spine, um, for AJ, but I, I, I've got to take it to that, uh, that Xfinity finish. Um, that was just amazing. So Will, I'll go to you quick. Uh, mine is recency biased, and I just got to think of the one moment that just had my heart pounding out of my chest, and that was Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Chase Elliott's in the midst of battle with Kevin Harvick. I love seeing my driver get involved in stuff, whether it was Denny Hamlin years ago. Uh, just any time you see emotion out of your guy and you see how much your guy cares about what's going on, uh, it, it's a favorite moment of mine. So even if Chase would have finished dead last because Harvick wrecked him, he got in his face, he talked about it, recency biased, I don't care. That's my favorite moment right now. Love it. Love it. Um, and that was a great moment. And again, it's not over. We're going to see more of that. Mark my words. We'll take it to a huge supporter. Um, shout out at big Luke 24 Lucas Mercier. He's been a friend of the program, support of the program really since it started. So shout out Lucas. Um, he wants to know, and I guess I will start. How does Kurt Busch do next year with 2311? Simple answer. Simple for me. It's quick. He will do better than what Bubba Wallace did this year. Absolutely, without a doubt. And that is not a knock on Bubba Wallace. I still think Bubba has a lot of untapped potential as well as Austin Dillon. Um, but Bubba has not been what I think a lot of people thought. Really the only place he's been competitive, um, and that's really only for a short amount of, amount of time, has been super speedways. We've seen flashes of what he can do. Um, but look, he, he hasn't had it. Kurt Busch, I think he'll have sort of a similar season to what he had this year. Um, I think he'll probably get them their first win. Hopefully I, I, I would, I would love to see that. Um, but I don't know. I I'm, I'm a little kind of pessimistic on what I think Kurt Busch would do, but it'll be better than Bubba. Um, well, I'll, I'll let you uh, take this one. I think he is similar to Bubba, but he's a few steps ahead. I still don't know if they're ready to win. I think here's what's going to be different this year is me and Armani talked about it. We thought they had high expectations, but we assumed with the budget they had, that they were going to be having big budget stuff. Well, you would assume, like every other partnership with a big team, you're, you're getting their parts, but you're not getting the cream of the crop parts, okay? Well, with the next-gen car, every single part is new. There is mm -hmm. no, this car is better than this car. So if you think maybe they'll be closer to what Gibbs can be, they sh Bubba should run better. Kurt is a better driver than Bubba, so Kurt should be a few steps ahead. Still don't know if they're ready to win. I think we have to kind of see that. I, I think they're kind of going to be on the same level of what Ganassi has been. Um, I think Kurt's kind of stepping into that same ride, except it's a Toyota with Denny Hamlin as your owner. So um, borderline playoff team, I don't know. I can't predict them to win a race yet because they haven't shown race winning speed at all. But next year's a completely new ball game. So we may feel completely different after the first two, three races next year. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to stick with Will real quick. Uh, another one with, uh, for you and then Armani, I'll get one for you there. So you have been a big critic of Matt DiBenedetto um, and rightfully so. I, th I think you do it in the right way where you want to see him win, you root for him, but you got to tell it like it is. Um, and I, I respect that about you. So this question, I want to see who it's from. It's from friend of the show, Tyler V 33 vanilla wafers. Where does Matty B go in 2022? 
I I, I had him going to the twenty three eleven ride because him oh, and the Denny okay. situation from remember when when he lost the race at Bristol a couple years <laughs> ago, I thought maybe there could kind of be that respect that hey I'll put you in a car. Where I would love for him to go, I don't think it's going to happen because it was actually a rumor that got shot down a couple of weeks ago. I really think where the best fit would be him to college racing yep. in the Xfinity car. I don't think that's going to happen. I, knowing Matt, I wouldn't be surprised if he forces the cup situation, even though he should probably go to the Xfinity series. If Ty Dillon's not really going to GMS, maybe that actually happens. It's so hard because you feel like it would kind of be done by now. Um, you know, maybe he goes, I think GMS is shutting down their truck program. So I don't think that's really an option where I think it's so hard. It's too hard to predict where he is going to go, where I would like for him to go is a place like college racing, go there or go to a Jordan Anderson, go to the Xfinity series where go get the Gibbs car in the Xfinity series, go do something of that nature. He'll probably manage to stay at the cup level somehow. I don't know where that would be, but I, it's hard to predict at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, good analysis. Um, I think I think we're all on the same page of that. Um, Armani, I want to take this one to you. So we saw you're a football fan. You probably watch Monday Night Football. We saw the Manning brothers do a little commentating on um, on a Monday Night game. So Dusty wants to know at w, uh, DWC underscore seventy eight, who is a retired. Uh, driver or group of drivers that you would like to see in the booth kind of doing something something similar dale jr is one of them i was gonna say jeff gordon but jeff gordon's just not good oh. at broadcasting i got he's, a he's, ter- he's terrible at broadcasting so dale jr god really besides dale jr i'm not sure There's- you can do better than that hmm i want to hear yours I, if Johnny allows me to answer, I will give you mine. Well, let me go. I'll go quick. I I, I said this um, last night. I think it should be for an you know for an Xfinity race. Get Kyle Busch and Joey Logano together in a room, <laughs> just Ooh. you know dissecting a race. I can only imagine how that would go. We're gonna dissect um, each other at the end. Yeah, right. For real. Um, all right, Will. What do you got for us? All right, you're gonna you're, you're gonna wish you had my idea after you guys said y'all's answers. This is boring. That we're we're being loose. We're having fun. Robbie Gordon, Tony Stewart, both in the booth at the same time. Oh, Why did gosh. I say Tony Stewart? Yeah, no, Tony would be great. <laughs> Tony would be great. Um, Just because, okay. first of all, yeah, Robbie Gordon, I don't know why I didn't respect him when he was a NASCAR. I, I don't I don't follow what Robbie does, but when you look back at Robbie Gordon, you're like, why did we not love this guy? <laughs> like, this dude did not care and can race anything. <laughs> get him and Tony in the booth together. They, I mean, they're liable to get taken off a of cable network before we get to the end of the race. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, another two names – Jimmy Spencer and Kurt Busch. <laughs> Fire. Oh Fire. my God. Imagine that. Oh God. Um, all right. So let's move on to the next question. And this is one that I think all three of us need to chime in on. Um, it is also from Tyler V 33 vanilla wafers. Uh, make sure you check out his podcast, the field fillers podcast. Uh, he does a great job. He gives awesome fantasy picks. Um, so yeah, please check him out. So he's got another question and this is an awesome question. Which drivers, and I'll start with you, Armani, do you think are going to make the playoffs next year that did not make it this year? This is a tough one. It's tough because not necessarily with the next gen car, but some of those bubble drivers, you don't even know where they're going to be. Like you don't know where Maddie D is going to be. You don't know where Stenhouse is going to be either. Some of these drivers that you can make an argument for, you first need to figure out where they're going to land next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the easiest answer is Austin Dillon. That's the easiest one. He should have made it if it wasn't for McDowell and Amarola winning out of nowhere. So that's number one. Number two, I'd say Busher. I think they're going to learn from it. I think Roush is going to learn from this. You know, they have to keep the momentum throughout the entire season instead of just go at the first half and then collapsing in the second half. So that's number two. If I had to pick a third driver, you know what? Just because I'm biased, Daniel Suarez at Trackhouse. 
my god <laughs> oh my god we we stopped the podcast and rebooted it up for that are you for kidding that. Me? Yeah. For that. oh my god <laughs> Dang, you should have um, rebooted that championship pick <laughs> oh my god uh, all right well i'll go to you uh with this yep. um and, and you armani missed a big name and, and i want to see if you catch it well We'll see. I, I could I could miss it. I think the singular biggest question is the next gen car mm-hmm. um, because you just don't know if it's going to level the field or not. I think Tyler Reddick um, is a name to watch. I think Austin Dillon. You mentioned Busher. I think another obvious one is Austin Sendrick. He's clearly not in the playoffs because he's going to be a rookie next year. Uh, not saying he'll make it, but assuming Pitsky's going to still be upper upper equipment, he's going to have a shot. Um, I'm trying to think of a big name. All of Gibbs made it. All of Hendrick made it. Uh, watch out for this. This is my last guy, Chase Briscoe. If he can make a, a step up from year one to two, this year was bad. Yeah. But remember, Stuart Hall says a hole was bad. So if Stuart Hall – and this is really an asterisk on if Stuart Hall is back to a competitive level, I think Chase Briscoe is a guy that could eventually make a jump. I don't know if he's quite ready in year two. That might be more of a year three pick. But I would go right now, Reddick – um, um, Cindric, just because obviously he wasn't eligible to be this year, and Austin Dillon is my well, bigger made it. who could. Well, true, I, that's true. I didn't think about that. I'm thinking of Reddit being eliminated, so I guess it'd be Dillon. It'd have to be Dillon, Armani with a decent pick at Busher, assuming Keselowski elevates that program. Austin Cindric, you uh, man, you guys are missing the big name. The guy that I think has has impressed me so much this season has been Ross Chastain. I had Chastain as a thought. The biggest question is, is track house. And this again is relying on the next gen car. Is it, are they ready to make a move? Ready for, I look at track house and 2311 in the same situation, even though 2311 should be better. Mm-hmm. They haven't been be- like, they have been better in a consistent stretch, but track house has shown more highlights this year. So Chastain crossed my mind, but are they going to be more level with the with the, with the level of equipment? Is Track House, assuming they obviously they're getting all of Ganassi stuff, they're going to be charters, all this. If they're ready to make that next jump, great. Uh, he's definitely going to be a name to associate with. Yeah, I absolutely. I, I was I have been so impressed with Ross Chastain this season. Um, just a consistent guy. Like you know, we, we knew he was pretty good at super speedways, but um, I mean, I didn't know he was that good at road courses. Like, what the heck? I I mean, where where did that come from? Um, hey, if yeah, you want on. a super sleeper, super sleeper, and, and you, we can all make these if you want. Super sleeper, just because they somehow find a way to be around with this particular driver, who I think is honestly overrated, Justin Haley in the full time ride next year for colleague. Because if they somehow squeak out a win at like a Talladega or a Daytona, mm-hmm. then they're in the playoffs. No, that's a great pick, and um, they. It's it's interesting. Both Chris Rice and Matt Cowlig have so much information about that next gen car. They might yep. know a little. They might know a little bit more than some of these other teams. Some secrets. Who knows? Um, but that is a great pick. I, I that one didn't cross my mind. But um, they went out and friggin' won a race this year. <laughs> I mean, that's insane to think about. Uh, not yep. even running full time. I mean, that's that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, Ross Chastain is the, the immediate thought for me. Um, if, if we were sticking in this package and this car, I think a guy you might want to bring in is Harrison Burton. Um, that, you know, that, that, uh, 21 car has been fast, Yep. you know, so a, a guy like him, pretty talented. I know he's kind of struggled this year in the Xfinity series. Um, but he's a guy kind of crossed my mind maybe, but at the same time, New car, next gen. I don't. I don't know if if they figure it out quick enough. Um, but yeah, I, I I like Chris Busher too. I think that's it because he's he's a guy. He's been there. He's pretty talented. But at this point, like you know, Roush is a tough place to be. If Keselowski can bring money, which he will, um, watch out for him as well. So I like that pick, Armani. Honestly, right, so, in a weird way. Yeah, go. Sorry to cut you off. I feel like this could be an even worse year to be a rookie in the Cup Series, and let me explain why we see how the transition from the Xfinity series to the cup series for rookies is so vast. Mm -hmm. Like Byron went from winning four races in Xfinity to getting four top tens in his rookie year in cup. We've seen bell where everyone thought he was going to light the world on fire. He missed the playoffs completely and barely squeaked out a top 20 points finish. So 
not only are you asking these rookies to acclimatize to cup series pressure to a cup cup series environment now on top of that you have to throw in hey you got to learn this completely brand spanking new car yeah everyone's got to do it but the veterans let's be you know the veterans are going to learn it easily they've been through five different cars at this point you know they're going to get it but the rookies you're asking not only for them to to obviously learn the cup series but now learn an extra car so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might be a little too much pressure to where it might debilitate them I'm, I'm i'm laughing because i i just picture kyle larson stepping in the car and just being like oh all right another car i can dominate in all right See, sweet. I, that's what's I gonna to happen just, baby that's what's gonna happen this is not the to larson extend decade. The, not to extend the side conversation too much but i tend to disagree i think it can help. I don't think you're just going to see Harrison Burton and Austin Senior go out and win three races each next year. They're probably still not going to win a race because they're rookies. But this is all they're going to know at the cup level. Uh, even though they may want to try to fall back on their Xfinity Series tendencies, this they know they have to wipe their mind clean. A guy like Kevin Harvick's been doing this for 20-some years. He's still going to lean on those old tendencies. And while this car may still have some tendencies that match the old car, and they've all – a guy like Harvick has switched generations three or four times in his career – this car is supposed to be different than anything we've ever seen. So, to me, it opens the door for a little bit level playing field because they all have to learn the car at the same time. I think you both make interesting points. Armani, I agree. This is something, you know, you have to add, first of all, your pressure as a rookie. Second of all, you're now in the biggest series of racing, you know, in the States. I mean, you could probably say in the world, right? And um, and then the added pressure of, brand new car that no you're not familiar with but nobody's also familiar with but i get the i i get will's point too like we're all on an even playing field right so if you think you're good if you think you're talented by all means you're just you know you're starting with the next guy right so um, i think you both make good points there um we got another so so we're talking in the future i got a, i got an interesting one here and we actually all got a chance to read this and will you had a funny thing um, we both were kind of like, we could make a, a, a full length feature film on some of the, on this guy's questions, uh, shout out Casey, shout out, uh, at paralegal 22, um, another supporter of the program. So he wants to get our thoughts on some sort of 24 hour NASCAR race, right? Similar to the Rolex 24, um, is that something you would be interested in seeing? I think 24 hours for NASCAR is a little much to be honest with you. Um, maybe a 12, maybe a 10 hour thing with um, some guys, maybe a guy from, you know, uh, like a, you know, a, a rookie and then an old veteran to kind of swap in. Um, so Armani, I'll go with you first. What are your thoughts on something like that in NASCAR? My initial thing is no, because we should be trying to go for shorter races, not longer races. I mean, besides the Crown Jewels, Daytona, <laughs> Bristol, Talladega, you know, whatever. Every race should be shorter, in my opinion. So to have a 24-hour race in there kind of just defeats the purpose. Though I would, it would be interesting to see how much of these cars, how much can these cars really take it over a long duration of time? Because, you know, you're like, okay, three, four hours or three, four hours. But to really see... The engine, I feel like the engineering side of these cars, especially the durability, would shine a lot more, obviously, in a 24 hour race. So that would be interesting, but I'm still leaning more towards no. Yeah, no, preach, preach on the, the, the shorter races. Will, what about you? What are your thoughts? Well, my mind has changed, like thinking about it since in the last couple of minutes since you asked, but I think Armani fully got me to no, I don't want to see it because. The only intrigue I have in an event like that is just to see if the cars hold up. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to attract new fans, they could care less if that car can make it 24 hours. If they want to know, though, they want the race to be exciting, and then it's over. Mind you, another problem we're going to have is what do we see in long, long races? Drivers tend to conserve themselves, and that's our biggest complaint. This isn't exciting. This is, there's no urgency. That's why I advocated a couple uh, earlier today about if we're going to go take Bristol back to spring in the concrete, let's make the race shorter. Let's make it different mm -hmm. than the long night race. Um, most There's only like seven or eight races on the schedule need to be as long as they are. We need to be cutting down races. A 24-hour race, as intriguing as, as it could be, maybe you could run all three series at one time at a big road course like, like Coda. Um, if your only intrigue is if the cars are going to make it, you probably don't need to lean that direction because 
as much as you want to care about the diehard fans, the diehard fans, as much as that's unique and fun, it, nobody really watches racing to see if the car can make it anymore. Um, it, it adds a, a it adds a new um, a new chapter to the book whenever that does happen. But very rarely does that happen, and we don't really miss it that much. Um, and the casual fan that you have to bring on to grow the sport, they could care less. They want to see cars beating and banging, a fun race. They battled for the finish, and then the race is over. They could, they could care less about the the intricacies of if the the suspension on the cars could withstand, you know, running 900 miles or however far they end up driving in 24 hours. Yeah, no, that's that's that is another issue of mine with it. Um, you're not bringing in any anyone, right? With the with the right. LA Coliseum thing, you know, a quarter mile track, probably a lot of beating and banging. First first race of the season, you're gonna bring people in. Right, especially at, at such a historical venue like the Coliseum. To to watch cars run 24 hours for even diehard race fans is a lot. Um, so you're not you're not bringing anyone in. Um, but but Casey, we appreciate the question. So, so thank you. Uh, let's go one more from Casey. He he had a lot of interesting stuff. This is the one I like a little better. Um, he 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 asked like thoughts on a legends race in 2022. Um, Casey, I advise you to watch the SRX. Um, you know, that's kind of what that is. However, I'm sure you watch the SRX, but however, um, I think you do have a point. Maybe if we get some legitimate legends, if, you know, if, if Jeff Gordon were to say I'm racing in a couple SRX races next season, your, our asses would be at that TV glasses on beers in our hand, ready to watch Jeff Gordon, tear it up in an SRS race. I, I know it. I mean, I, I know you guys absolutely would love that. Um, so in that, I would say, hey, I, I'm all for it. But I think he had an interesting one here, which was changing up throwback weekend to a, a little something different, where we kind of pick a decade, whether it be 90s, 80s, 70s, take it even back to 60s. And, you know, they do a paint scheme, but they also race in that in that car now i don't know if that's something they can do but what i will say is they could go to an older track right that's been on the series let's say in the 80s and they take like late models right and 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 race those so not only do we see history we see old paint schemes we also see a different car that will showcase kind of how the drivers actually how, how good they are stepping into a different kind of car will you go I, I see you got something so i got something that'll it appease everybody here this all is right. what you do for one we're not going to just have an all-star night we're going to have an all-star week all yes. right yes we're going to bring it back home to charlotte because that logistically makes sense for what i'm about to lay out <laughs> every single night for five or six nights you have an event pit crew challenge i don't care if you have the hauler driver challenge they used to have to where they would back in haulers and move their haulers like that only certain people care about that, but that's fun. It gets people involved. Um, so picker challenge, hauler challenge, burnout challenge. All oh, right. Yeah. So one night, let's take legends cars, the local legends cars, and run them on the legends track. And let's put legends in those. Let's put legends in the legends cars. Let's have guys like Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, Bill Elliott. You know, the list goes on. Let them run a 50 lapper right there in the little quarter mile or however long, eighth of a mile, however long it is right there at Charlotte Motor Speedway. All right, you have that one night. Um, you you brought up an interesting question about I didn't think about this putting drivers in the older model car. So let's take the day's drivers. Let's pick a generation, and I don't know if it's possible. A lot of that's really dependent on inventory of what you could find, and you really don't want to tear up a lot of stuff if you're driving classics from the '60s and mm -hmm. '70s. But if you can get your hands on it, let's go to you know a, a local dirt track or short track right down the road that's that's suited for a race you know maybe it's I, I can't i don't know what is the logistically closest to charlotte motor speedway there used to be like concord speedway and places like that um and, and let's go get 15 20 of today's modern drivers and go put them in old school classic cars um and let them have a race or or again maybe more fitting let's just do a super late model race or a late model stock race um and that's during the week of all star week and then you eventually I don't know why I've been advocating. We need to have a truck series and an Xfinity series all-star night, put them on the same day together, make them really short races. Um, Cause there's only going to be seven or eight cars in each race. Let those guys represent the best of their, of their, you know, said divisions. Um, and then you have the cup series all-star race right back at Charlotte motor speedway where it needs to be to begin with. 
back. Yeah, to think they uh, and I, I'm gonna let you you chime in as well. To think they moved the, the All Star race to Texas, maybe my least favorite track to watch, an absolute snooze fest every time we go to Texas, mm-hmm. and and it's sad because Texas used to put on a good show. I mean, the last like five plus, maybe you could say like eight years. Texas is just god awful. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, so I like everything you said. Well, I think we need to spice it up. Get get rid of Texas. That was a terrible decision. It's sad that it's on the schedule next year. Um, but Armani, what do you got for us? I pretty much agree exactly with what he said. You need to make the weekend fun. You need to make it an all star weekend. The main reason, the main knock I have against the clash at the Coliseum is that I talked about it on one of my episodes. Is it kills speed weeks? It's good for the event, for the Clash as an event by itself. It's good for that event. But Speed Weeks as a whole to build up the season, it's dead. There's no build to the Daytona 500 anymore, in my opinion, as hot take as it sounds. So to have the All-Star race kind of have, like, you know, that build up, it, I agree with everything you said. In terms of the type of cars, you got to remember, especially back in the day, not a lot of these cars held up. So, I mean, I guess it depends on what track you're going to go on. You'd obviously want to go to like a, honestly, probably less than even a half mile track or a dirt track. Because back in the day, some of these races, do you think four hours is long? Try watch. I guarantee you, breaks from back in the day were way over four hours long. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Um, I, I did see, I did see you kind of. Uh, go off on on the uh, Coliseum and Speed Week, um, but I am excited. I agree with what both of you guys said. I, I think you you guys make great points, um, but in general, I think the three of us can all agree on that this needs something to be spiced up. Um, so on that note, thank you to all the fans that submitted questions. Um, we got to I think all of them, or at least as many as we could. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it from us. We've got an awesome next three weeks. It starts this Sunday at, I think, 7 p.m. Eastern at Las Vegas. Then we move to the maniac that is Talladega, and we'll take it to the Roval to end the round of 12 in the playoffs. Um, Guys, Armani, Will, you guys, I appreciate you guys so much. Some of the first guests I've ever had, you guys have been supportive of this podcast. Help, Help me grow and help this podcast grow, so I can't thank you guys enough on that. Um, and just shout, shout out, uh, shout out this show and, and thanks, uh, for, for helping me guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate it, man. Obviously go Panthers. And just a reminder <laughs> for Armani that Spire Motorsports and college racing have more cup wins than Jimmy Johnson in the last four years. Last thoughts We're from going you, Armani? To fight. <laughs> What'd you say? We're going to fight. <laughs> well said, well said. All right. Um, and that's going to do it for Johnny on the track. Again, this has been Armani, the motor minister himself, and NASCAR opinion, Will Richard. Thank you guys both, and uh, we'll see you next time on the show.